The first case of reported HIV infection was reported in 1981, which is roughly about 44, 45 years, no, 44. Now, since then, we still are grappling with HIV. Every now and then we have incidences of uh, high infection rates, and since then we've never had uh, like a break. Now, there's one thing you need to understand about the viruses. Viruses usually mutate very fast and two things can happen. Either they can just mutate towards their death or they can mutate towards living better with the, the host. Now, if the virus, when it comes to now, virus mutating very fast towards dying or maybe killing the host, those are two ways it can be able to kill itself. Meaning that if it's not giving the host enough time to survive and stay long enough for the whole cycle of the virus to, to just go through, we have uh, the virus getting to the cell and then replicating and then getting out. If the host dies in between that period, it means that that virus will not survive long enough. And uh, this is the reason why you find that um, we have so many viruses which have gone extinct just by using that method. Unfortunately, it's very unfortunate that it can also kill so many people, so many hosts in this case. So it can kill so many of them within that short period of time. So both of those can uh, just eliminate each other. So the virus just dies and also the host dies. Only those that will not be affected by the virus will be left. Now, we still have other ways, like for example, the virus will just mutate toward becoming less lethal. So the virus is not able to infect or to be less virulent, meaning that it's not be able to effectively um, infect the host, meaning that even the ch survival chances become very low. So if uh, it mutates and uh, the mutation affects the areas where it, it's, it's able to escape maybe the host immunity, it means that now it becomes even harder. Now, we have other viruses which are a bit, I don't want to say that they are clever, but we have um, some mechanisms that they usually use to live longer. And one of which is HIV. Now, you see, HIV, if we start from uh, just the infection, for us to just have a grasp, I want to give you much information about HIV because now we still have the issue. Uh, and yeah, actually, we from the report that just the other day about uh, the HIV infection in Kenya, uh, the burden is still very high and uh, we have very high infection rates. Now, I want to just give you just a rough idea of what usually happen. Now, you come into or you become exposed to HIV virus, guess what usually happen? It gets to, let's say, this time, it's uh, just through sexual activities. So you meet your partner or a partner or whoever person that you met, they're infected by HIV. So they are going to have viruses in their sexual fluids. Now, guess what you have? Around where you have mucosa, either in your, um, where you have the urethra, the opening of the urethra in men and also in women, both uh, the urethra and also the reproductive system, that's the vagina, there's something that we call mucosa. And in that mucosa, we have immune cells patrolling those areas to make sure that there's no infection ge getting there. Now, we have HIV, which is not easily killed by those that usually patrol, those the, the immune cells that usually patrol around that those areas. So there is something that we call APC, which is antigen-presenting cells, which means it will come into contact with HIV, doesn't know what this is. So it goes back to the adaptive immunity and signals and tell the whole system that hey, there is something new. We need to create something that will go and fight that. So the adaptive immunity will create what we call antibodies. The antibodies will be what will go and uh, fight off that infection. Now, this time we are dealing with HIV. So during the contact with the macrophage or whichever that was there around there patrolling, that interaction, the HIV gets into that cell because it requires three things. It requires uh, the CD4 receptor. It requires uh, the core receptors and the active cell. So if the cell is having CD4 cells, so well, several things will happen. One, it will bind to the CD4 receptor. Second, it will bind to what we call the core receptors. And we've talked about this. We touched this about those people who cannot get HIV because they have a mutation when it comes to the core receptors. And uh, we also have the GP41, which is um, will allow the fusion of the membrane. So that's how the cell will just get into, no, the HIV particle will get into the cell. Now, this has happened. 
and uh, it gets into the cell. Now, HIV or whichever virus cannot be able to exist on itself. So it must use a mechanism or hijack a mechanism to try to copy most of the copies of itself and create protein that will coat that uh, the RNA or even if it's a DNA. So the protein that usually coat and protect that virus is uh, now still assembled inside a cell. So what we call that is um, it's a parasite. So HIV and any other viruses is just a parasite because it cannot be able to like replicate without getting into an active cell that has a full mechanism of copying things. Your cell is one of them. So once it gets into that cell, it starts multiplying and creating new copies, new copies, new copies, new copies, to a point where there are so many, they kill the cell. So that cell just bursts and guess what happened? The copies which were already made, guess out, they, they get out into the blood. And um, this is a foreshadowing because you're going to get to that point. The copies that are just out are the ones that usually test when there's something that you call viral load, which is how many uh, copies of HIV viruses that you have in a certain amount of uh, uh, volume of blood. So that's how we get to check the progress of your HIV, according to maybe if you're taking the ARVs or during the initial visit, we want to know how many copies you have so that we see whether you're going to get the aggressive type or you're going to just, uh, first of all, uh, just enroll you in the normal program. Now. That's a lot of, we're going to make a dedicated video about that in the future. And actually, this is a series, I want to make several uh, videos about HIV because we need to have a lot of information because it kind of feels that uh, we've learned so much about it to a point we are now ignoring it and this is the reason we're having so much of that infection going on all over. Now, um, we got to a point where now uh, it killed the cell and it burst out. Guess what happened? The new copies will just start, uh, and by now it's inside the blood. So by now it gets into now the system, into the blood, and start now looking for the cells that contain the CD4 cells, the CD4 receptor on their surface. So they go patrolling and they f infect anything that comes their way that has a CD4 receptor. So they do that to several more. And the same cycle continues, continues, and that's why when you have HIV, you are going to be immunocompromised because of this, uh, the killing of the cells. Now, some of those cells, some of them, no, actually not the cells, some of the HIV viruses will mutate and they are going to now invade other areas like in your brain. And this is the reason why it becomes a little bit hard to treat HIV virus completely. It gets to immunoprivileged areas like your brain. Now, in your brain, no, of, there is no cell, the, the immune cells cannot get there because this is an immunoprivileged area. And one of the reasons why no cells is allowed there, even blood doesn't get there, and that's why you have CSF. CSF is cerebrospinal fluid, and this is the fluid that will be used to now replace blood inside the brain, so inside the spinal cord and the brains. But now, HIV is able to penetrate there, there is no uh, immune cell that will get there, so guess what will happen? It's just going to stay there. So this is the reason I usually say, uh, if you take care of the viral load outside, this is mostly what the ARVs will work on. They will work on what is outside those immunoprivileged areas. So in case maybe that virus comes out, it's going to be killed. So you can be able to just stay negative, but you still have the infection. Yes, okay, you cannot say that you're negative. You still have the infection, but you can be in a position where you don't transmit this to other people because the infection is in the brain or in the immunoprivileged areas, so they don't get to get out. Anything that gets out, it comes into contact with the ARVs in your system and it's either killed or maybe the the ARV will prevent that virus from replicating or creating new copies. So that will be kept. That will be very nice. It will be kept in check. We talked about people cannot be able to get HIV due to a mutation in a receptor that HIV usually used to get into the cells. And we talked about that at length in a video. I think I'm going to link it if I remember. I'll link. If, if I don't remember, you can just look for a video about HIV and uh, those people cannot be able to get uh, this infection due to this mutation on their core receptors. Now, uh, still back to the viruses. HIV and several more viruses, they usually migrate to areas where immune cells cannot get, and that's why it becomes a little bit hard to treat this infection. The same goes to something like HSV, which is um, happy simplex virus. You have two types, you have type one, which usually affect the mouth region, and you have type two, which usually affect the genital area. Now, both of those, 
can get to areas that immune cells cannot get. Like for example, the type 1 which usually affect the mouth can get to trigeminal ganglion which is a concentration of the cell bodies. So this is areas where your immune cells cannot get. We also have uh, the one that usually uh, is located around the sacral region, so we call that the sacral ganglion. That one will also be a reservoir for HSV type 1, no type 2. This is the reason why it becomes a little bit hard, not actually, it becomes very hard for that treatment to even work because once it hides there, there is mostly less you can do. You just wait for that virus to just come out in case there's an infection, you kill that. That's how mostly that usually happens. Now, let's get to uh, HIV. We have stages. Now the first, the initial stage, which is um, the reason why we have false negatives. We have the initial stage, and if you remember, we talked, I mentioned something about antibodies. So the initial stage, you have that virus, your body doesn't actually know how to do or what to do during this period. And because it takes a little bit longer for the recognition and production of the army that will come and start fighting the HIV viruses in the blood or in your body, because they take a little bit longer, by this time, they're still replicating and creating more and more and more and more copies. So you have a lot of that, and some of which have just migrated to your brains and the other areas that your immune cells cannot get to. So... It comes to a point where now, and during this period, we call this window period. So during the initial infection and uh, when you start getting the first symptoms, this is a very, very infectious stage. And during this period, you're having a lot of uh, those HIV viruses and you can transmit them easily. But when you go and test using the normal kits we usually use for testing for HIV, it becomes very hard. You cannot be able to detect that using antibodies-based kits. So it becomes a little bit hard. And that's why... Um, I usually tell patients once, for example, I'm testing for HIV, you turn out to be negative, or maybe you're planning maybe to marry or something of the sort, maybe you want to know that your partner or something. Most of the time, and especially this time that is really happening in Kenya, most of the people usually test for HIV, they want to go and not use protection. That's why they are coming, for example, to get tested. So one thing you have to understand is you can be in this period where you will still very infectious, but you turn out to be negative using the kits that you're going to find in the pharmacies and also in the laboratories and also in the clinics that are close to you there. So most of the complicated and uh, sophisticated tests that you find out there, they are not in the reach of so many people because they are more expensive and uh, yeah, so they are not so many. So those which are available are what we call RDTs, which is rapid diagnostic test whereby you just draw your blood, you put it there, you put a buffer and you will just give it time to see whether you're going to get two lines which will be a positive, you get one line or the control line which is a negative or maybe a repeat in case maybe there was a discordance of the result. Now. Like I said, during the initial stage, you're not going to be, you're still going to be positive and you're going to be negative using the conventional kits. We have the next one, which is, okay, when, for example, you go and donate your blood, the tests that are usually done, one of which is HIV, we use ELISA, which is more specific and more sensitive, so it's able to pick HIV even if it's just very, very, very some few days old. So it's very, very easy to capture that HIV in very, very initial stages. That's why it's usually very advisable to, if, for example, you want to just get to know your partner and get to know their status, first of all, just to know, get, get to know how, for example, uh, their sexual life is. And from there, after the initial testing, once they turn out to be negative, observe the sexual life and make sure that they are, they are not interacting out, they are not having maybe going out somewhere, maybe meeting new partners or something. Just make sure within those um, within the, uh, an initial three months period, once you go back and test, so three months will be enough for the HIV viruses to have rep uh, replicated and your body to have responded so that by now we have the antibodies that will be tested and it will be easy for anyone to just test using the just normal kits and get to know whether that person is positive or negative. So it's easy to just tell. So during the initial stage, just use protection. Then uh, after the next time, when you maybe after three months, you get to, you, you're still using the protection. So after you come back for the testing, we get to test you again. And from there, we can have a higher confidence that you're negative. Okay, we still have people who still can get really, really long periods before they start getting to give out um, or they start 
getting to a point where now it turns out to be positive and they're still positive and uh, they call carriers. No, they're not carriers per se. We're going to have a topic about that. We get to give more information about this. But uh, it's possible for, and I'm sure you've seen people, uh, something that you find that um, discordant, discordant couples. You find that uh, one is positive, the other is negative. You're going to talk about that should be a topic because you also need to talk about what we've said here, those who cannot be able to get HIV, those who take a little bit long before they start showing the signs and symptoms, and we have those who cannot be able to even transmit because they cannot get that infection. So we are going to have a, like a topic on itself about that. Now today we're just giving an overview, and then we're going to go into also, um, diagnosis is not hard, we are just going to cover that, that just today. But uh, there's something that we call the follow-up. What are the things that are actually done? Once we discover that you're positive, what are the things that can be done to you? And also the treatments. We have so many types of ARVs. And uh, we need to know how they function and what they do. And uh, also we have the types, the, not actually the types, the categories. You have those that you get to take if you are about to get exposed to HIV, or maybe you are suspecting that you might get exposed to HIV, so we have drugs that you can take to prevent you from getting that. Also, after the exposure, maybe you've been exposed, maybe there was a rape, or maybe there was um, an accident, or maybe something that happened, and you got exposed. If that's the case, we have drugs that you can use, which usually take for 28 days, that will prevent you from getting that infection, even if whoever person that you got into, or whatever, maybe you get, got exposed to that virus, you're not going to get that infection. But once you get that infection, you have the ARVs, and that's where you're going to, uh, that's what I was saying, that we need to know the types, what they do, and uh, how you're supposed to take them. So I think that should be that on itself.